Hello, I'm Matthew McClendon. I'm the J. Sanford Miller Family Director at the Fralin Museum of Art at the University of Virginia. We're all living in an extraordinary moment right now with COVID-19. Usually in times of crisis and stress, museums remain open as places of refuge and contemplation for our audiences. But with COVID-19, we know that the best way we can serve our community is through closing, promoting social distancing, and helping to flatten the curve. I'm joined today by Henry Skerritt, my colleague from our partner museum here at UVA, the Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection. Henry is the curator of Indigenous Australian art there, and he is the curator of the exhibition, The Inside World, that he'll be taking you through today. He curated it for the Nevada Museum of Art. It's now touring the country and here at the Fralin. We thought this would be an excellent way to share the exhibition with the students who can't be here now because of COVID-19, but it's also a wonderful way to share it with our audiences in general. I imagine that you might be watching this video, sitting at home, practicing the social distancing that we all know uh, we have to practice now. I hope that this brings you education, some new information, a moment of beauty in your day, and like everything we do here at the Fralin Museum of Art, I hope it sparks your curiosity. Thank you. Hi there, my name's Henry Skerritt, and I'm the curator of Indigenous Arts of Australia at the Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection of the University of Virginia. Okay, so even though we're not meant to be traveling, today we wanna to take you on a journey to one of the most spectacularly beautiful parts of the planet. We're gonna to head to Northern Australia, a place called Arnhem Land that occupies 37,000 square miles on the northern tip of Australia. It's home to 10,000 Aboriginal people who speak around 20 different languages. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the show and we're gonna travel from west to east and we're gonna look at 112 works by 55 artists, some of the leading artists in Australia and they're all from this very special place. Are you ready? Let's go. All right, so now we're in the exhibition. Take a look around. What do you see? What do you feel? To me, it's like walking in a forest. Here we are surrounded by 112 memorial poles. Each one was once a tree that's been hollowed out, but naturally by termites. It's had its bark stripped and it's been painted with these very beautiful designs. Now, when we walk around here, we're gonna walk from west to east. And I want you to look at how different each of these poles are. There's no, there's no one Aboriginal people. When Captain Cook arrived in Australia in April of 1770, there was, there was half a million people living there of over 300 different language groups, right? And each of them was different, is as different as you can imagine somebody who lives in Minnesota being from somebody who lives in Florida, right? And so as we walk around, we're looking at people who are related. All of these artists are related in some way, they're related by the places they come from, they're related by the ancestral narratives that connect them all. But I also want you to look at how different and distinctive each of the artists are, because these are artworks. Now, once upon a time, poles like these would have been made for a very specific purpose. They were made to house the bones of the deceased. When an Aboriginal person died, there would be an enormous funeral ceremony. There would be sacred songs that would be sung. There would be dances performed. The bodies would be smoked and painted with sacred ancestral designs. And at the end of all of this ceremony, the body would be placed to dry, either on a rock crevice or on a raised platform, until all of the flesh had decayed from the body. At that point, the family would collect the bones and they would carry them. You know, they would carry them around with them for a number of months until they felt that the spirit had finally left those bones and that that person had returned to the ancestral realm. At that point in time, they'd get the bones and they would stick them in a hollow log coffin just like these. And those coffins would be painted with special designs that would help the spirit return to its ancestral home. Of course, today, that practice is no longer uh, done. People don't like to keep bodies out on raised platforms. Um, so today, uh, most Aboriginal people will be buried uh, in the ground, um, similarly to 
uh, practices here in the USA. However, memorial poles are still made. They're still made for ceremony. But more importantly today, they're also made for art. And that's what we see around us. Each one of these works reflects those ancient traditions. And it has a connection to those ancient traditions. But at the same time, it reflects the individual artistry of every one of these artists. So let's have a look at a couple of specific works. And I always like to start with these ones by the artist Joe Goimela, in part because Joe came for the opening of the exhibition, so it seems polite to talk about him first. But also because what Joe's done here is he's painted skeletons. And the reason for doing that, as he would explain, is that he's trying to educate outsiders to what these poles would have been used for. He's trying to say, look, this is the tradition that we once had of painting on hollow log coffins before putting in the bones. Next to Joe's work is the work of Gabriel Marilangura, another leading artist from Inulac Arts. And Gabriel, instead of painting bones, has drawn on the rock art tradition of his country. Now I told you that these artists come from the very western part of Arnhem Land. Western Arnhem Land is, is I mean, it's spectacularly beautiful. You have these sweeping long floodplains, and then you have these gorgeous red rocky escarpments. And those escarpments contain some of the highest concentration of rock art in the world. And that's what Gabriel's done here. He's taken designs from the rock art and he's transformed them onto the hollow log coffin. Now, Rock art's really interesting. Somebody once said that rock art in Arnhem Land is a bit like if every artist in the history of European art had just been asked to paint on a single piece of paper. So you can imagine taking that piece of paper and it's got some early cave paintings and then you know along comes Michelangelo and does a bit more on top and then Cezanne does a few mountains and finally Banksy comes and does a big spray painted stencil over the top. That's what the rock art of Arnhem Land is like. And so what Gabriel's given us here is a little art history lesson. He's shown you older styles, painted over with newer styles, and they're all there in this real melange, this, this palimpsest of different artistic styles. Now, one of the things that you'll see that's really neat with Gabriel's work here is that some of the paintings that he's done at the very bottom are in nothing but red, right? And that's because a lot of the oldest work on the rock art, the, the, the works they know are the oldest, are just red. And it's not because they would have been initially painted red, it's because the red has lasted the longest. You know, whereas white has tended to flake off, the red has remained. And that reminds us of something also really interesting about all of these works, that everything in this room is natural. Gabriel has selected a beautiful natural pole with some gorgeous knobs in it. He sanded it down and he's painted it with natural pigments that he's mined from the earth. We've got these reds and and yellows that come from ochres, which are stones that he would grind himself and mix with a binder. And um, we've got the white, which comes from a pipe clay, which is highly prized because you've got to dig it up from um, creek beds or from uh, by the side of the ocean. And so everything here in these layers is natural, right? It all comes from the earth. Um, and that just adds to the kind of connection between these works and the country that they come from. And I say that's important because what I want you to think about as you're coming through this exhibition is that everything in this exhibition is very, very ancient. But at the same time, everything in this exhibition is very, very new. And that's not to say that it's innovative or that it's traditional, but to, to make us wonder, like, what do these words actually mean? What does it mean to say that something is a traditional practice versus something is an innovative practice? Because I think in all of these works, we see a bit of both. And the next artist I show you is a really good example of that. It's pretty hard to talk about the art of Arnhem Land without talking about John Molenjel. Molenjel is one of the most famous artists in Australia. And we're lucky he came to Charlottesville in February of last year. Now, Molenjel 
is another artist from Western Arnhem Land. And as I said, Western Arnhem Land, it's the painted landscape. It has this extraordinary rock art all across the country. But you'll notice when you look at Mohenjo's bowls that they're very abstract. In the mid-90s, Mohenjo really led the charge of artists in Western Arnhem Land to remove figuration from their work and develop these shimmering cross-hatched designs that, he called, that they call rark. Now, you might think that that sounds really innovative and really modern, but the source of his rark was actually the designs that were painted on the body during very sacred ceremony. So again, he was looking to the past for his inspiration to take the art to the future. And what Moanjil says in these polls is that you can feel the shimmer of the waters and the lights as it reflects. And for him, that's the power, that's the ancestral power of these places. That's the power that comes from their spiritual energy. And what he's trying to do in giving you these abstract designs is give you a sense of that power in nature, while also suggesting that there's a lot of things that are hidden from view. What's really nice in this exhibition is that we've got six works of Mollinger's here, dating from 1988 all the way through to 2017. And the reason I mention that is because Mollinger didn't move abstract in his bark paintings until the mid 90s. But what you can see here in these poles from 1988 is that poles were some of the first places that he was experimenting with this kind of rock abstract patterning. And that's really interesting as we move through and think about innovation and tradition, to think that these seemingly traditional objects were actually a site where this extremely important artist was doing his earliest important innovations. So I know the burning question you've got is how did these poles that were once used as coffins become contemporary art? Well, the answer to that has a lot to do with the artists of Ram and Guinea. In 1988, Australia was celebrating 200 years since the British invasion. And needless to say, whilst Prince Charles was down there with the Prime Minister in Sydney Harbour and there was boats coming in and fi uh, fireworks, Aboriginal people didn't really see it as something that they wanted to celebrate. Now, the artists of Ram and Ginning had been invited to participate in the Sydney Biennale of 1988. And rather than protest by not participating, they decided that they would do something very radical. They produced a work of installation art called the Aboriginal Memorial, which consisted of 200 hollow log coffins, one for each year of the British occupation. It was a real turning point in Aboriginal Australian art, and many people see it as the moment that Aboriginal art really broke through into the contemporary art world. But for the artists of Arnhem Land, I think it also gave them a moment to reflect on the metaphoric power of the memorial pole, of all of the things that it could embody about life and death and loss, uh, all those universal themes that we're gonna see throughout this exhibition. So far, we haven't talked at all about women artists, but women artists are a really important part of this exhibition, and they're a really important part of the contemporary Aboriginal art movement. So let's have a look at these poles from the Garawura family of the island of Milangimbi. Now, Milangimbi is a tiny little island, and it's located right off the central tip of Australia. Um, it's home to about 800 Aboriginal people, and in the 1950s and 60s, it was really one of the epicenters of Aboriginal art production. Today, they have a very successful art centre that's doing some really amazing things. Now, you'll look at these works, and they might look similar, but look closely. Every one of these artists is taking a different riff on a very similar, but very important design. Now, this design belongs to the Liaguamara clan, um, or otherwise known as the Garawura family. And for a very long time, the only person with the authority to paint this design was this fella here, Miki Darang and his brother, Tony Danyala. Now, normally, 
when somebody like Mickey Darung and his brother Tony Daniela would die, they would pass those designs onto their son or onto one of their surviving brothers. But in 2006, just before his death, Mickey Darung made the very unusual decision to pass the authority for these designs over to his sister, Ruth Naumakara. And in doing that, he was recognizing that she was the person best equipped to keep these designs alive, to keep them strong. And so under Ruth's stewardship, she opened up the designs to allow them to be painted by her sisters. And that's what we see here. We see four works by Mickey Darung and then a dozen works by the Garawura sisters. And if you look closely, you can see each one of them has taken these designs in a unique and innovative way. Each of these designs speaks of enormous layers of meaning. They tell of the arrival in this area of two sisters named the Junkhao sisters. And everywhere they went, they planted their digging sticks in the ground and created water holes. So these designs, they speak of the power of the sun, they speak of moving waters, they speak of the land, and they've got layers and layers of other meanings that are all embedded in these designs. And whilst they have to stay relatively faithful to these designs, these simple stripes, these wonderful sort of Union Jack patterns, what you can see here is half a dozen artists who are really finding ways to express themselves within this. I look at these and I think I love the sort of slightly um, slightly wonkiness of Margaret Raru's. I love the precision of Hen Helen Gunnell Middleway's work. And each one of these women is, is adding their personality to these very sacred ancient designs. So what do I mean when I say that these artists both embody ancient traditions, but also their own unique personalities. You know, when we say something like that, we've really got to interrogate what it means to talk about individuals or, or personality, because those things are, are, are not the same. They don't mean the same to everyone across the world. And I feel like this is a good place to talk about that because I'm standing in between the works of two amazing artists who are both very big personalities. Jambo Marawili and Nongar Marawili. Now they're both Madapa artists from uh, the Bukulange Mulka Art Centre, uh, which is based at Yirikala in northeast Arnhem Land. So while we started our journey in the stone country of Western Arnhem Land, we've now moved to the east where you have these gorgeous white sand beaches and the, the most pristine blue waters you've ever seen, which would be great if you wanted to go swimming except they're all kind of full of crocodiles. So let's start, let's start by looking at Jambua's paintings. And I want you to look very carefully at the designs in these paintings and, and just think of what they evoke. We'll just scan down these poles and I want you to just take a moment and ask yourself, what do these designs make you feel? What do you see in them? Think of it as a sort of a virtual Rorschach test. To Jambua, these designs mean something very, very specific. They relate to a very special place named Yatikba. Now, back in the ancestral times, what Jambua would call the Wanga, there was a fella named Baru. And Baru was sitting on the beach with his wife and they got into a huge fight. Such a huge fight that Baru stormed off to his hut to bed and his wife set fire to the hut. And so Baru comes charging out of the hut on fire and he dives into the waters at Yatikpa. And as he emerges, Baru's transformed. His body is scarred with these diamond shapes and he becomes the crocodile. Now, if you ever see a crocodile, a crocodile has these diamonds along his back. And as Baru stood up, he held two fire sticks and the fires roared from his sticks and they traveled across the waters to all of the other clans. Now, when Jambawa was here in Charlottesville, he was looking at some of these designs 
And he said to some of my students, he said, look, look, see? He said, look, you can see the crocodile diving down. You can see the waters crashing over. You can see the fires raging up. And then Jambor stopped and he said, hmm. he said, that's just the kid's story. Underneath that are layers and layers and layers of meaning that only he gets to know as an initiated Madhapa man. Now, one of the things that I've often wondered with these poles, these are memorial poles. They are created to house the bones of the dead and the loved ones will come to these poles as a reminder of those people. They will hug them, they will kiss them. But what are they remembering? You know, this isn't quite like a tombstone. It doesn't say, here lies Jambu, a great leader and artist. What does it tell us about Jabwa, that these memorial poles contain these designs associated with country. Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think it talks about a very different way of thinking about who we are. This is a way of knowing who Jabwa is that he was born with. He was born with this ancestral identity, this ancestral identity that connects him all the way back to the creation times. And in painting these, Jambu would say he is Baru, he is a crocodile man. And so in a way, this tells us something much more essential about Jambu than mundane details about when he was born, where he lived, what he achieved in his mortal life. I'd like to come over here for a minute and take this a little further because here we've got the works of Nongirna Marawili. Now Nongirna belongs to the same clan as Jambwa. She's an old and very knowledgeable woman. She was born in 1937, right? And to put that into context, the first mission at Yirikala was founded around that same time. But Nongirna didn't move out to the mission. She stayed living on her homelands with her father, Mundukul, who was a great warrior. She didn't, in fact, come in to the mission at Yirikala until she was in her late teens when she was going to get married. Now, Nongna is one of the most highly inventive artists. I think, I think she's one of the best contemporary artists working anywhere on the planet. And around about 2012, Nongna decided that she would start painting Madapa country, the same country as Jambua. But in Nongna's work, if we look closely, we don't see exactly those same designs. We see these much more open, much more expressive, much more individual designs. And when Nongana was asked about that, she said, oh no, 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 I'm not painting the sacred designs. I'm not painting those clan designs. She said, that's the job of my brothers. That's the job of Jambawa. I'm a woman, I'm just going to paint things from my head and from my heart. That's what she said, I'm gonna paint from my head and I'm gonna paint from my heart. But the weird thing with that is that when we look at her works, we still see these diamond patterns, right? We see these very uh, evocative shapes that do look a lot like those designs in Jambu's paintings. And I was lucky, I had the chance to ask Nongana and I said, Nongana, you know, look, these look like Marapa diamonds. And Nongana said, no, 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 no. She said, they're not Marapa diamonds. Go ask Jambua and see what he says. So I went and asked Jambua and Jambua, uh, Jambua said this thing to me. It was really, it was really interesting. And he looked, we were standing in, uh, in the art center and along one wall was his paintings and one along the other wall was Nongana's. And he said, well, Look at mine, then look at hers. Look at mine, look at hers. Look at mine, look at hers. And he said, and now squint a little. And he said, and if you squint, it looks a lot like Madapa diamonds, but they're not Madapa diamonds. He said, it's just the country speaking through her. And I thought that was a beautiful way of describing it because as I said before, for Jambua, these designs tell you something essential about who he is. And Nongirna, what Jamba was saying, might try and paint her country and she might try and paint from her head and from her heart, but who she is, is so formed by 
these places that she comes from and her knowledge of it, which comes from those ancestral designs, that try as she might, they're always gonna speak through her like some inalienable hum that's sitting there in the background of her very essence. I think that's very beautiful. But at the same time, Nongena, in saying that she's painting from her head and from her heart, is able to experiment. She's able to twist and turn the forms a bit. She's able to find unique and individual and expressive ways that make her a highly individual and unique contemporary artist, as well as an artist alluding to her great ancestral traditions. So traditionally, when indigenous people in Arnhem Land were looking for a log to make a hollow log coffin from, they'd look for one that was perfectly smooth and cylindrical, not unlike this work here by Bema Munungur, right? You can see it's really smooth, it's pretty even, right? It's quite cylindrical. And on this, Bema's painted these beautiful designs. But in the mid 2000s, as people started thinking about these works more as art, something really interesting happened. A number of artists began to look for really gnarly, knobbly trees, which they could exploit those natural imperfections for the kind of metaphoric impact. Now, one of the artists who did this really with the greatest aplomb was this artist here, Goimbi Gunnamba. So let's take a real close look at these works of Goimbi's here. And this is a great grouping because Bayama has painted here these designs that relate to the Bay of Gutapada. Over here, we see Goimbi's interpretations of those designs of Gutapada. And here, we see a third artist, Manini, and her depictions of Gutapada. So if we go back, we can see these sacred waters washing over, intersecting, but we can also see them done in three very, very different ways. But I'd really like to zoom in and look at this work here by Goinbi Gunnamba. And look what you can see, right? Goinbi has left large chunks of the tree intact. He's left its bark on there. But underneath, in the parts that he's cut away, you can see these ancestral designs peeking through. Now, the thing to know about Aboriginal culture in Arnhem Land is that ev absolutely everything has an outside and an inside. It has an outside meaning and an inside meaning. The outside ones are mundane, day to day, every day. The inside ones are ancestral, they're spiritual, they're powerful. Okay, so what's going to be saying here, right? He's saying, peel back the skin of the tree. And what do you see inside? It's inside meaning. What do you put inside one of these? The bones, they're the inside of the person, right? The skin is the outside. And so here you've got a tree trunk where you're putting the inside of a person inside the inside of a tree, and you're painting it with designs that come from the inside of that person, their ancestral essence. And what a great metaphor for that, leaving the skin intact and just peeling it back to show you that inside world. And just look how beautiful this is, right? The sacred waters of Gutapada mixing and crashing onto the beach. And look here, the tree just emerges out like the bay, like the bay where these waters are just crashing onto. I mean, what a magnificent way of evoking the natural world using this extraordinary natural material. And of course, all of the materials in these objects is natural. The, the paint that these artists use is mined from the earth, it's ground, the trees are natural. So we've got this hugely amazing confluence of the natural world coming together in every one of these works. A lot of people come into an exhibition like this and they think, well, you know, there's all these things that are very esoteric and um, come from another culture and how, how am I meant to understand them? But one of the things that I'd really like to get across about so many of these artists, artists like Goyen B, who we were just looking at, is that they're, they're really trying to find ways to communicate across cultures. They're really trying to find ways to communicate something about their culture to the rest of the world, right? to those who, who are outside of Aboriginal communities. And one of the women who I think has really 
you know, really philosophize this in a brilliant way is this woman, Gulumbu Yunapingu, right? Gulumbu, hugely famous artist in her life and really one of the very, very important women artists um, from Northeast Arnhem Land. And if you look closely here, what Gulumbu has painted is the stars, right? She calls these Ganyu, the stars, or Garak, the universe. Here they are, all laid out. Look at all these stars. Now, what you might not know is that these stars relate to a number of very specific Yong narratives, Yong ancestral narratives. And one of the things that Gulumbu said was that she saw her father painting these stars as part of those narratives. And if you ever look at her father's work, the great Mungurawa Yonopingu, you'll see that these stars are often a, a little portion of a very grand narrative. But she just took that little bit, and in taking that little bit, she expanded it out to something that is absolutely universal, the universe, right? And Gollumbu said the most beautiful thing. She said, one day I was sitting there looking up at the stars and I thought there are as many stars as there are people. And how can we be that different if we're all under the same stars? What a beautiful sentiment, right? We are all different. We all have our own cultural backgrounds. We all see the stars from a different perspective. These guys see them from the Southern Hemisphere. But we are all people, right? We all have things that unite us. And the things that unite us are those things that you can communicate cross-culturally. Those things that unite us are the things that allow artworks like these to speak. And I think that in the stars, Gulumbu found that perfect metaphor. Look up into the sky and see all those different entities. But they're all part of one universe. Few artists have really tried to exploit the metaphoric power of memorial poles like Wook and Wanambi. In here, we've got an installation of seven poles. And what Wanambi's tried to do here is show you what he calls the life cycle of a memorial pole. You'll see that this pole still has its bark on. It's just like it would have been when it was plucked from the forest. Here we've got one that's been sanded, and at the back, some that have just had their undercoat. But towering over the middle of them, we see this, this stunning pole, covered in millions and millions and millions of fish. Wuken calls this installation Bumurungu, right? Bumurungu is a rock. It's a rock in a bay called Gurkawoi. Now, even though that's a saltwater bay, they say that freshwater bubbles from the top of it. Okay? And Wukun calls this installation Bumurungu because you've got these poles circling around, circling around. You look at these fish really closely and you'll see that these fish are circling around. They're circling around the rock. They're circling around the rock. These are a very specific fish. They're, they're a, a, a mullet, and they're specific to the Marakulu clan, of which Wukun is a part. When the Marakulu dance, the leader of the dance carries a spear, and he charges at the other dancers, and they, 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 they swarm around him like the fish swimming around the rock. Now, Wukun... Wukun says that those fish swimming around the rock are swimming around looking for their ancestral destiny. We have this great quote up on the wall where Wukun says, we believe that the spirit travels through the water and returns to its source and is born anew. The body dissolves and the bones return to the land as the larikich decays. So this is this amazing thing here, these fish swimming around, swimming around, but ask yourself, why does he then open it up to this bigger story of the life cycle of the larikitch? Well, I'll tell you what I think. Right? 
When you hear Wooken talk about this, he says these fish are searching for their destiny. They're swimming around looking for their ancestral waters. And what Wooken says, and he says this in the catalog, he says, that's just like what you fellas do when you go on Ancestry.com. I thought like, aside from being really funny, it's a really interesting metaphor, right? Because when we go on Ancestry.com, we're not looking for our destinies. We're looking for our pasts. But what Wooken's saying is that these fish here are swimming around looking for both their past and their future, that those things are all connected. And in pulling it out to the life cycle of the tree, Wooken's trying to point out that this, this fish, they're searching for their destiny the Marakulu destiny. That's Wukun's destiny. It's not our destiny. That's his destiny. But in pulling it out, he's reminding us that it's all part of a universal system of which we all belong, right? Think about it. We all start our lives as tiny saplings. We grow into a tree. We're hollowed out. We die and we are born anew, right? And so, in a way, what these poles, what this grouping is telling us is, is something really important in our world today, okay? Something that I think this current moment makes all the more urgent. It's saying, yes, we are all different. We all see the world through a different lens. We all have our own destinies. But for better or worse, we are all connected. And I think that's a really beautiful message here, right? It's a message that tells you if you go through this exhibition and you don't understand everything, that's okay. What you need to understand is what are these communicating to you? Come to them with an open heart and you'll find that they're communicating both our differences and those things that we share. Because we all love we all experience loss. We all grieve. We all mourn. That's what makes us human. That's what's on the inside, right? On the outside, we show those things differently. But if we can work out how to communicate, if we can work out how to communicate the things that we share as much as the things that keep us apart, I think that's a very powerful message.